Uh, nice. Great. Hi, Annie. Hi, Andy. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. So we're just just coming into the group now. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to make sure that everything's OK. And uh, there we go. Just bear with me a minute. Let's have to do that. Oh, there you go. Right, good. Uh, just going to wait for people to come in the room, people coming in now. Say hi, everybody. Uh, I'm having a few problems with my camera, uh, everybody. So I'm just going to keep an eye on it. Uh, and if it plays up too much, then uh, I'm going to have to lose the camera and you'll have to not have my... It's just me they have to see. Just you, exactly. They can just see just you. And um, uh, hi, Denise. Uh, Denise is here. She's been, she was screaming, bring on Annie, bring on Annie earlier. So she's getting very, very excited. Hi, Angela. Hi, Amy. Hi, uh, Kim. Hi, Jack. Great. People are coming in. That's great. Good to see you all. I really hope my camera's going to play ball. We'll see how we get on. Um, uh, well, it's great to see you, Annie. We've got a lot to discuss tonight. Uh, and um, uh, we'll just wait for more people to come on in. My, my camera's really not doing much. I, I really apologise about the visual thing. I don't know what's going on with it, to be honest. Um, yeah, it comes in and out of blinking. Yeah, it does a blinking thing, which is quite new. It's probably because it's on the way out, sadly. Uh, well, hi, team up. Great you found us. That's great. Hi, everybody. Good. Right. So I think I am going to lose my camera. I'm just going to see what happens. I think that means in the group then it's just going to be you, Annie. Uh, there it is. So Annie's full screen in the group. I can see that. Brilliant. So the spotlight's on you, Annie. Uh, great. As it should be. Nobody wants to see my ugly mug anyway. Uh, great. So we've got a good chunk in the room now. That's great. Well, welcome, Annie. Um, We've been looking to do this for a little while, actually, and, and of course we will want to try and time it in with your with your new book, which we're going to look at in a minute. But um, uh, there's been a few kind of delays with that, but I think I think we're pretty well there now. Are they are they? Yeah, I'm in the editing process, which I don't like. Um, they've uh, changed the date several times for a variety of reasons. Some of it is out of their the publisher's control. I do have faith in this publisher. I think they're a good publisher. And they're going to do right by the book. Um, they put in a ton of photos. Some um, the people that I've interviewed from all over the world, other professionals, have sent me amazing photographs of their dogs. So it's going to have like the Midnight Dog Walkers, which was a different publisher, has a ton of photos. Like it almost looks like a magazine, which I was not expecting of the Midnight Dog Walkers. And I wasn't expecting as many photos in this one because photos are expensive for publishers. But there's paper shortage in China, all sorts of things. But we're on track, and supposedly. The end of May of this year in the States and June elsewhere, like the UK and Canada. So it's coming. It's, it is, in fact, coming out. <laughs> Brilliant. Soon. Well, that's good. well, we'll, we'll come on to that. Um, we'll come on to that in a, in a bit. So we, we can give a little nod to that. And uh, uh, again, anybody who's tuning in now, my camera's off because it's it's not working very well. I'll try again in a minute, actually, and we'll see how we go. Uh, Annie. Okay, great. Well, let's just think a little bit then, Annie. So um, we were thinking before about how we kind of connected because we've known each other for a while now. And I think we've both kind of found ourselves um, almost in the kind of front row of seeing what's been changing within our industry in the last few years and the different things that have been happening. But let's start off with a little bit of kind of Annie's story, I think, about your own your own journey in to thinking about dogs, how you've evolved yourself and, and what led you up to your brilliant first book, The Midnight Dog Walkers, which is, um, I think when I first met you, actually, um, I just finished reading it. Incidentally, it wasn't because I, I knew you at that point. Um, and it was a great book and it's been a book that I've recommended to clients and things. So yeah, let's see a little bit about Annie's story. Well, thank you for that. And that book has been out since 2016, which is hard to believe. And it does have an older uh, underground cult status, I think, for lack of a better word. Of course, it's out of print now, so you can't get it. That was not my decision. I even tried to buy the title back. I did disagree with that. Um, so it's Kindle, it's mostly Kindle, and even some places Kindle isn't available. We do give them away from time to time because I squirreled away some on the Midnight Dog Walkers chat group and elsewhere. But um, I wrote that book from my experiences. I was writing for Dogster at the time, um, but my I feel like I've had a, a love affair with dogs um, and respect dogs and learn from them and need them in my life from a very young age because I grew up in such, like many of us, highly dysfunctional family. And really the only time I saw love was between me and my dog Cricket, um, who showed up one day, unneutered, houndy, German Shepherd. Maybe that's why German Shepherd's among my favorite breeds. Um, he just said, I, I live here now. <laughs> and um, 
that's back in the 70s outside of Austin, Texas. Dogs roamed freely, did what they wanted to do, came home for dinner, that sort of thing. Completely different than how dogs are raised now. But I, so I was, I needed Cricket. I, he was my emotional support dog before there was such a thing, because honestly, he was the kindest thing in my family. And so I've always felt a deep obligation to dogs because that, I, I did a meme recently that I saw on a chronic um, fatigue, chronic PTSD site that said, um, I don't think they said animals, but I, I changed it to dogs sometimes are the first example we've seen of love in some of our lives, which is sad. <laughs> and it's putting an awful lot on the dogs. Um, but out of respect for dogs and what they gave me, I've been a fierce advocate for them since day one. I, I got into fostering first in Texas, which in the late 1990s, early 2000s, it's still rough in particularly rural areas. It's somewhat improved from what I can tell, but the South, uh, all rural areas, but also big cities, you know, they can do horrible things in sheltering and also wonderful things and we need them. But I decided that I want to work with dogs that are going into shelters um, because I was pulling for a, do a nonprofit rescue that was, we weren't breed specific. We wanted temperament and health because we wanted to find the youngest, healthiest, non bitey dogs that we could find, which was a lot easier 20 years ago than it is today, completely different genetic pool. Um, so I gained real world experience by going into shelters where dogs were enormously stressed. There was a horrible one in Austin called Town Lake Animal Shelter, which has since changed and a different group runs it now, thank God you were unsupervised. You could walk into any kennel. And I did. And I love German shepherds and Rottweilers and big, strong dogs. So I would walk into these kennels and have to make a split second decision based on experience that the dogs taught me. Is this dog safe? Am I going to be bitten? This dog is stressed. What does stress look like in a dog? How do I know the dog's stressed? How do I know that I'm one second away from a bite? By the way, I've never been bitten um, because of what these dogs taught me. Um, and then I got interested in training because I could see all of these dogs being put in shelters from owners who were overwhelmed and frustrated for what I thought were fixable things. Jumping on people, pulling on leash. You know, it's not the biting and mauling of people that unfortunately we're seeing to now, now, which are very serious issues or extreme reactivity or extreme anxiety and fear in dogs. Um, it, was, it was obedience stuff back then. And so I kind of, I've always felt that it's an emergency to help dogs because of the way they've been treated. When you're in shelters, and rescue work, you see the best of people who are adopting and helping these animals and bringing troubled animals into their home and not all shelter dogs are troubled. Um, and the very worst, like one of one dog I'll never forget, his name was Kaiser, um, was dumped is how I rephrased it then in the Town Lake shelter, which is a kill shelter back in the day. They don't hold, they didn't hold them. You've dropped off your dog, they could put him to sleep and did before you got back in the car because there was an over, and still is an over pet population. Kaiser was a beautiful, well-bred German shepherd. The lady wrote a heartfelt note, which many don't, you don't know anything about him. And this dog protected her from um, someone who broke into her house and was trying to beat her up. I don't know if she knew the person or not. And the dog didn't hurt the guy, he just held him. He, you know, like bite and hold, except he didn't bite. So the dog literally saved her life and she still had to give the dog up. And we got her to great home. And back in the day, I was like, how dare she? And this dog saved her life. And, but as you grow and learn more, it's more about she didn't have the financial wherewithal or any support anywhere back then to keep the dog. It was heartbreaking for her. It was hard, and it is heartbreaking for many people who give up dogs. So I'm not really faulting that. Although again, in rescue, you see the worst of humanity. So that's why I started writing for Dogster thinking I, I'm a journalist. I grew up in journalism family. How can I help owners not have to give up their dog for something that is a fairly easy fix in terms of behavior or obedience. And again, so much of it was obedience. We were all very focused on sit down, stay, don't pull on the leash, don't jump on people versus now it's even more an emergency because dogs have so much anxiety and stress just as humans do. So I wrote the Midnight Dog Walkers while I was writing for Dogster, um, telling, it was kind of a half memoir, telling of my experiences and some of the horrible things I've seen. like. And, and I left out a lot because some of it is just, you know, I could write an entire, I could write 10 books on the horrors that I've seen people do to people. And that's why I think I'm, and being a journalist that I ask why, why is this happening? Who, what, where, when, and why is we're taught as journalists, but I always want to know why. And I always want to follow the money because there is money that we can talk about later involved in some people's decisions in the industry. Um, so I come at looking at welfare for animals very much from a rescuer, 
um, foster, my husband and I fostered 400 dogs over 10 years. We had a big ranch in Texas and had room to do it. Um, and it was eventually, the, way, the, the day I stopped was when I was called to get a rush pickup of three beautiful Great Pyrenees mixes, puppies, dumped that day at the kill shelter in downtown Austin, an hour away from me. I go get them, they're adorable. I have photos of all these dogs. I knew that they, those three were safe and I'm driving along and there on the corner in Texas was the guy who, who um, inbred poorly, horribly, like genetically deformed and emotionally deformed Labrador retrievers, very popular breed. He was on the corner, I was at the stoplight and I watched him with six puppies, no parents around. Those, those puppies probably won't be spayed and neutered. He didn't know what home they were going into, what kind of home, what kind of life they would have. And I thought that one person is undoing everything I've just done for 10 years with mm -hmm. that many things. And it was very depressing to me um, to do that. And I also have fostered so many that I ran out of names, completely ran out of names. And one of the last ones I littered, uh, littered I, I fostered was, uh, they were pit bull puppies, which I love pit bulls. One was white, one was brown, one was black. The only names I could come up with were whitey, brownie, and blacky, which stuck. Their names stuck with them. And I like, I need a break from this. And that's when I moved into training. I wanted to become a trainer. Um, I wanted to stop the just massive dumping of dogs for reasons that I felt we could help. That was my goal in becoming a trainer. Again, from a shelter person or a rescue foster person's perspective. Um, when I looked at training schools, I was in the deep in the heart of Texas in Austin, there was one in Texas and it's a Schutzen school, which is a sport um, that involves bite work and obedience and tracking like Mondio ring. Um, I don't think Schutzen itself is as popular as it was back then. This is in 2007, so it's been a few years. I had to make the decision then, do I go through this school because it was important for me to have the knowledge, the formal education, I, I wanted that and I valued that. And I, I knew there were shot collar trainers. I knew I would never use a shot collar. I was, I just didn't need to and didn't feel the desire to do that, but I wanted to learn it from the inside out. And I'm glad that I did. And I never used one ever since um, for a variety of reasons. Or I could have gone to, and I regret, this is one of my regrets, I could have gone to Gene Jonathan's school in California, which was to me and still is one of the best of the best. Um, but I chose to not leave my dogs and my husband's. We just moved to a ranch, my husband. So I only have one husband, even though I'm in Utah. Anyway, focus. So I didn't go to Gene Johnson's. I regret it. I went to the Schutzen School. It was three months. It's the worst thing I've done in my life, among the worst besides the rescue work. Um, dogs ran through the shot collars. Like it was a big indoor building and the trainers, the professional trainers were down at one end with their dogs all on shot collars, no matter what. We, the students had rescue dogs that we were working on that we were required to put shot collars on. Every day, just about a huge German Shepherd, Cane Corso, all the big tough breeds that need tougher care, according to not care, tougher training, according to a certain mindset, they'd run through it, run through the shock, screaming and yelping and kind of crumpling. I mean, it's horrific to get to the dogs that we were with, and some were attacked, and some vet bills were required. I mean, it just, it was not a friendly place. I remember an instructor there saying with great pride, because I, I love German Shepherds. I had German Shepherds my whole adult life and I had German Shepherds then. I went through the course with a, a male border collie at the time, however, but um, he told a story with great pride that I just thought of the other day that he woke up in the middle of the night and his number one Schutzen dog got out of the crate. At least the dog was in the house. I gave him credit for that, but in a crate and he woke up and the dog was staring at him. You know, the bed was low enough that the dog's muzzle was right here. And he had to think calmly. And he told the story, think calmly, give a command in German, plots, lie down, whatever it is, um, to try to get the dog from that hard stare. Like if you've ever been stared at a dog with that death stare, like make the wrong move and I'm gonna bite you and bite you hard and it's not a nip, you're gonna be damaged. I'm biting with attention. So he was terrified of his own dog. The dog was free and had no shock collar on it, no way to at least attempt control. And he thought he might die. And he somehow got the dog back in the crate and the dog lived and he lived. That's his working partner. That's his working relationship. And I got in trouble. I raised my hand a lot and said, excuse me. And I knew that. And I, I knew that I was opposed to the training. I did, I did learn some things um, that one of the instructors did clicker training on our own dogs, not client dogs. So um, it was a good exposure to clicker training and agility and you know, some of the stuff was good education. I just knew that I was not going to use the harmful tools that they needed to use and wanted to use. 
It just wasn't for me, but I know it. I've done it. I put a shotgun on a dog. I'm not a crossover trainer. I don't consider myself that. Um, I knew before I ever did it that it's something I didn't want to do, um, but I know how they're used. That's an argument that the aversive set likes to use. You've never used it. You don't know how to use it. I, I do. I do know how to use it. I choose not to is the difference. So that's a little bit of, and then I went on to become, um, there were so many schools popping up online and webinars and everything else came into existence. So you didn't have to just choose between two possible schools. There was a whole lot more, got certifications. Um, and I've been working in behavior ever since. And it's changed the kind of things that we're seeing with dogs these days. Although reactivity and aggression is still the number one complaint. I just saw another study about that today. So that's a little bit about why I wrote Midnight Dog Walkers. I'm like, I wanted it for owners to have a tool set that they could begin working with their troubled dogs. Um, because there's, there weren't enough and there still aren't enough good positive reinforcement trainers that specialize in these difficult red zone behavior cases. Sure. There's not enough of us, um, period. And there's not enough veterinary behaviorists. I think there's 90 now in the world. So I wanted owners to have something as a reference to say, I can try this. I can take a few steps forward and not wait for six months. And that's what I wrote my second book for. It's, it's reactivity and aggression, but be well beyond that. It's got all the common behavioral issues that owners struggle with, barking, excessive barking, chasing, um, you know, jumping on people, nipping at heels. And I interviewed about um, 20 experts from around the world. And, and you're in the book, Andrew's in the book. He's in the uh, canine bond chapter, which is a whole chapter, which could be a whole book. So that's that's what the next book is about. Well, well, well there I'm gonna try my camera again now, see if it's, because uh, um, I don't like the idea of you just looking at a blank screen. Uh, hello everybody, my name's Andrew. <laughs> I'm back in the room. Uh, we'll see how it goes on. But yeah, so if, just going back on that then, I think. <clears throat> Couple of questions then. What was your influence? So, so like you say, you know, when you think about at that time, um, a lot of the stuff that was around you was potentially more dominance aversive based. You instinctively, in a very heartfelt way, connected to those animals, the dogs that were in the rescues, you recognize their vulnerabilities. And then when you start thinking about going down a training route <clears throat> to see the use of really hardcore aversives like the shock collars, that must have been a really difficult time for you to kind of square that circle really and so how did you combat that did you kind of were you aware that your initial thoughts and feelings were very much being compromised by this or hadn't had those bits not quite fallen into place in that fuller picture way at that point i think because of the family i grew up in um full of narcissistic injured adults who were injured by their parents. Many people have that experience. I'm not alone in that by any stretch. I knew that there were real dangers in the world. Like I have said to people, the movie I saw once called, I think it's Frances Farmer with Jessica Lange. She was put in a mental institution by her mother in the forties, because they could do that then. I have said my mother would love to have done that to me because I was troublesome because I asked a lot of questions. I always have, why are you doing that? This doesn't seem normal. This doesn't seem healthy. Um, the black sheep of the family. So I grew up in a family system where I knew the parents, I mean, parents can kill their children. It happens. Husbands can kill their wives. That happens a lot. Um, so I knew that just because it's another human being doesn't mean they have my best interest at heart or theirs. And so it's a fine line. And I think that's why I was so interested in journalism besides growing up in a journalistic family, is that we ask why. Why is this happening? And, and a bird's eye view. I like to look at the whole thing and, and think about it deeply. Why is that person doing that? What does that person have to gain? Like, I am suspicious about that a part of human nature. Why are you, what do I have to gain right now? You could ask me. What do I have to gain about speaking out and defending dogs? What is my personal gain? It's not money. <laughs> I don't make any money doing that. Um, I don't want to be anyone's hero other than a dog's. Um, it's just something, it's integrity and it's ethics mm -hmm. for me um, that I cannot not speak out. So how did I deal with it? Well, a lot of the word that came to my mind was rage. It enrages me, um, but you can't get a lot done if you're just stuck in rage. And I have been stuck in rage for many, many years. I feel like I've kind of in the last five or 10, now that I'm almost 60, I I feel like I can laser point the rage where it needs to be pointed. And I do have a lot of rage at how animals are treated and women and children. And 
homosexuals and disabled and people of color. Like the disenfranchised um, as a group were treated pretty shitty in the world, um, all over the world as well. So I um, am very aware of that. I'm aware that people can be dangerous, not only to me personally and to you and to everyone. Um, there are people who are not nice and they're not kind and they have different intentions and belief systems and motivations than I do. And unfortunately, um, some very hard, ugly people, non-caring people, narcissistic, I would even say some are sociopathic or sadist, sadistic, want to control dogs and they can. And mm. then they want to control the owners who, own, especially the women, uh, there's a lot of misogyny in our industry. And there's a lot of women tearing down women, which is a real rage inducer in me. Um, so there are people who are dangerous to dogs. So when people say, let's all get along as trainers, everyone loves their dog. That's not factually true. Everyone doesn't love dogs. There's a subset of human na nature that wants to control the hell out of dogs. And they will use whatever tools they can get in those countries where it's still legal. There are some kinder countries, um, Austria, the Netherlands, Queensland and Australia, I think there's like 20 countries now or so that have outlawed shock and prong collars. So you are not allowed to use them. I consider those more compassionate countries than the United States. We are not a compassionate country by any stretch and haven't been probably forever. But you know, I've never seen a clicker trainer. I've never seen clickers banned. You know, I think about that. Whenever there is, I, I did this research for the Midnight Dog Walkers. Whenever there is a dog mauling, attack and it's more and more and more and more severe. Um, I know the UK has had a ton of, and including children, just outright killed by dogs. I, I dig deep and I look at the journalistic stories um, where they name a trainer and sometimes they do and sometimes no trainer is made, named or rescue, I go deep. And you can do this too, people. Google is your friend. You don't have to have special training to be curious and to research stuff. And every single time there is a mauling, and I'm not kidding, every single time, a dog is mauled and they name a trainer that was in charge of that dog. I looked them up. They were trained by the guy with the big teeth who has a television show. He trains a lot of trainers or a master trainer or a military trainer. So a military trainer and a master trainer is, what, the word master bothers me, are the dogs the slaves? So I'm saying that there are people who are dangerous and that will do harm to dogs. That's who I'm talking about. That's my rage. That's who I will always defend the dog because the dog can't defend themselves. Um, that's how I deal with it is speaking out against it. I always have, I always will. I take a lot of heat for it. I don't care. I do not care. Um, because what they say about people like me <laughs> and uh, making fun of me or whatever they wanna do, it doesn't hurt me as much as seeing a dog shocked. That hurts me a lot more. And that's, I don't understand. I guess I don't, I do understand, but why doesn't it hurt the trainers who are doing it? Do they not understand canine behavior or do they compartmentalize and say, yeah, I know the dog looks scared there, but I need the dog to lay down for five minutes or tough. Um, there's a whole lot of issues in our industry. But for me, causing uh, a, a dog with no defenses other than their teeth, and then when they do fight back, God forbid, what happens to them against their abusers, a lot like women in domestic violence and situations, they can go to jail for killing their abuser sort of thing. Um, there's, a, there's more people out there like that than we think. And that's what I've been talking about. Don't, tell, don't come to me and tell me everyone in training got into training because they have the same love of, love of dogs that I do. That's not true because humans are complex. Some people are in it to control dogs and then their owners, period, end of story. You can do it with a clipper, I suppose. You just don't do the damage that you do with a shot collar. I mean, yes, you can say clicker trainers can be not very well versed on it and they can cause for confusion and frustration in the dog. That's a world away from causing a dog enormous stress and distrust and they're not safe. Dogs live for 10 to 15 years and they, they don't feel safe for those 10 years. I mean, I can't, I will speak out about it. I will continue to speak out and I know you do as well. There are many of us who do. And I think you've made some really powerful points there about <clears throat> actually it isn't just about dog training it is a bigger picture here about this notion that um <clears throat> you know we think about children should be seen and not heard women should be seen and not heard 
uh, dogs should be seen and not heard. It's that kind of thing of somebody deciding, I know what's best for another. I, I need this behavior. I need that compliance, that obedience in order for this to be okay. Uh, and quite often that can be, that person can feel that they're doing it through, from a position of love. You know, we hear this a lot. Maya Rose um, shares this a lot with her work, talking about domestic abuse, how some, you know, often the other person is, they're like, you know, if you do this, then everything will be okay. It's only because I love you that I need you to act like this because you can't behave like that because it's not right. <clears throat> so there's a lot of similarities here and a lot of connections. And I think uh, this is something that we, we need to keep exploring more because the more we learn, the more we look at the science, the more we recognize what it is for the individual underneath the behaviors that we exhibit. Uh, there's more and more water between us now and, and, a, and a very task oriented approach. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's hard then to kind of record, to think that we're somehow all part of the same professional pool. Right. Because the differences are just too huge. Uh, I saw a comment on a piece that I wrote yesterday. Uh, somebody said, oh, well, I do know, I do know aversive trainers who, who really understand the emotional side of behavior. And I think that's a bit of an oxymoron for me, Annie. How can that be? Uh, it's kind of thinking, okay, I know that you feel, I understand that you have those feelings, but one, don't show them. And two, if you do, I kind of need you to not act that way. Gaslighting. I, there's a lot of gaslighting. gaslighting. Mm. There's gaslighting in this industry. And I also maintain that those of us who have been abused and had uh, trauma in our early childhood, which is a whole lot of us, if not, as you say, almost everyone has trauma, has experienced trauma to some degree. Sometimes you're lucky and it doesn't happen when you're a child, when you need to help adult help the most. Um, but if there is trauma in everyone's life, then if you're, and you care so deeply, like I have lived my life in service of dogs and horses and other animals. So it emotionally pains me. Like I can't watch shock trainers do that to their dogs. I, I cannot watch the pain and the fear on the dog's face. I don't know how they do it. I absolutely do not. Either they don't understand it or they don't care. Those are the only two options that I have come to. So it's re-traumatizing those of us just to hear it, to see it, don't watch it because it's out there. They're probably putting it on their YouTube pages and in business pages. It's, you don't have to look very far. I once did, and I would encourage people to do this. So we're told as force-free trainers by a certain set, be nice, get along. We can learn from everyone. Everyone loves their dog. Thinking that we can bring them under the fold. We, once we give you the education that you are in fact scaring your dog, you are not creating a safe face for your dog. You're going to change Mr. Dog trainer, Miss dog trainer, right? Not happening. There are more dog shock, shock collar trainers in the US than there has ever been. So this is my challenge for you. If you don't believe me and you don't have to ask me, dig deep and ask me the same deep questions and check me out if you would like to, but Google. I Googled my state in the United States uh, maybe when I was writing the second book. I wanted to know how many trainers that I could at least find online were um, shock, shock, shock trainers versus cookie pushers or whatever you want to call us, um, force free. I looked at 20. 18 were shot callers, and most of those were franchised, so they had several locations. Two, and I was not one of them, I was not included in the list, I'm kind of new to the state, or whatever. So if you're a dog trainer where I live, in the Wild West, in the States, you have to go through 18 trainers, potentially, to find the two who are not going to harm your dog, and call it training, and charge you 3000 a week or 6000 a week to bring back a crumpled dog a dog that doesn't trust people very well. It's hard to trust your abuser. They may look good, but it's shut down behavior versus trust. So um, this idea that if we just are all nice and sing kumbaya and um, everyone loves their dog is false. I I've said it for years. It's not true. There are, there are segments of people who do not love dogs. Or if they love their dogs, it's a kind of a sick, weird master, you do as I say, dominance which I don't see as healthy love. And we know that dogs love us. We know that we love them, you know, that it exists. It's possible that it exists. So do your own research, as he say, as the conspiracy nuts say. Um, Google your state, Google your province. Take a big look around and see how many um, trainers are using shot collars and what they charge and how many are not and what they charge. Um, is it money? Is money a huge motivator? We're human beings, we have to pay the bills. 
but I choose not to because I feel that I'm an ethical person and I love dogs so deeply. I choose not to use a tool that I am trained on because I could charge a heck of a lot more money if I did. I make, I made the choice. I, it's not even a choice for me. I just am not going to do that. I would like to hear from the shock dollar collar trainers why they feel it's okay. When all the science is saying positive reinforcement training is more effective and it doesn't break the bond. Like, why are they willing to ignore that we know there is a bond and trample it? I do wonder whether the, the money's an interesting point there because um, getting access to outdated information and advice is very easy. It's on most of the TV shows. Um, it's very prevalent out there. And it's really easy. You know, we've got somebody local to me who's, uh, you know, dog walker now doing behavior. And she may as well have, I, I think she's just watched a few episodes of Season of Lamb. I, you know, I, I don't see anything different in those posts. So actually, it's a cheap way to think you're doing the right thing. And then once you're in that route, it's very hard to have some kind of understanding that maybe that isn't right. And actually, you're learning something that isn't right. Um, when we think about getting access to the current science, you know, the courses that you and I value and that, that are out there, is there a financial, is it prohibitive for some people to even think about going through that route? Is that, and, and I th so, so there's a lot of extra complexities here, I think. And also we do have a society that's still based very much on that good to bad continuum. That somehow, you know, some behaviors are good, some behaviors are bad. When we think even about children, I think the way that we treat children has come on a bit in the last maybe 10, 15 years, but it's still, very much about the child is loved if they behave in a certain way. The child is good if they behave in a certain way. Uh, you and I, you know, we, we learned a lot more recently about, um, you know, the, the importance of secure attachment for, you know, early on. And um, I think these things are really important. So, so it's quite interesting. And also uh, some of the arguments that we get back. So, so the common one, I think, that I see, and I've seen it on my own post, it's this notion of the red zone dog. Uh, you know, um, there, there's been a chat recently with a well-known trainer and, and, and you know, from both sides of the fence uh, sort of thing. But uh, that's something that came up, this notion that, you know, sometimes you just got to do it to save the dog's life. And, and, I, and I find that that's, the, that's kind of like the ultimate in scraping the bottom of that barrel there, really. Um, and I do wonder whether how often something similar has been said to another in an abusive relationship. This yeah. is kind of that. This is you know, if, if I'm protecting you from yourself, you know. And I didn't ask you if you if I needed your protection, for so-called protection. Yeah, they a lot of their arguments are very tired and very old, and the science they lean on is outdated. And a lot of the science is cruel. I think it was Pavlov, who they love, and Skinner, who they love. Yeah, it's important. They made some important discoveries 150, 100 years ago, 80 years ago, 200 years ago. What about the last 20 years? They cherry pick the science that they use. Um, I think it was Pavlogs that, um, and correct me, and I know that the audience will, that uh, his laboratory flooded a lot. He never fixed the flooding. So the dogs are abused in the name of science to discover everything that you can't you could have figured out by living with dogs in my opinion you don't need to harm them to figure out some of these things but harm was the standard and still unfortunately is in in many scientific experiments it's only slightly better um so they drowned in their cages and they were only brought out they weren't allowed to be dogs they weren't sniffing they weren't running on a field they weren't chasing rabbits they were captive prisoners whose cell sometimes would drown them Think about the panic. I mean, I, that's what I can't get past is the panic. And that's the scientist that is the holy grail. I mean, a dog in a laboratory is completely different than a dog out in the wild, just like the dominance theory, which many aversive trainers have it all over their websites. And frankly, they just look childish and out of touch. Dominance theory was debunked by the very scientist who came up with it. Look it up. Do your research. I mean, we're taking preaching to the prior to choir here. I don't know how many of them will see it um, because we've said it for years. Dominance is not a thing. It doesn't exist. Go away. It's about captive wolves. So when I look around at a trainer's experience, yes, credentials are important because they show me that you have spent some time studying the almighty science, 
but you could be a very good test taker and not have your, put your hands on one dog, not to harm it, but to train it. So I would, I value the, the trainers on the street who aren't fighting in these wars, these made up internet wars and speaking out of ego, um, my way is the only way and you're dumb and you have the quadrants wrong and that, what did you call it? The um, quadrant merry-go-round, operant merry-go-round. Mm. Um, I value people who have worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different types of dogs and got them where the dogs needed to be without harming them. You know, like why, why is a trainer, and not just me, but I'll just speak out of my own experience. I've had two sets of siblings, which siblings, oh my God, don't get two dogs, um, that are very well adjusted and both had horrific beginnings. The, the Border Collies were stuck in a horse trailer and not socialized in the dark, like in a horse trailer, in the middle of a field, on a ranch. <laughs> No socialization. The, the female hid under the car seat when I brought her home so hard that we had to remove the seat to get her out. She went on to become a therapy dog. She had all sorts of certifications, a real working dog. Both of my border collies did. Now I have two healers taken from a veterinarian. I love veterinarians, but not this one. He took it at five weeks from the mother. They're car phobic because of what he did to them right after that one time learning event. But my dogs are happy. They're well adjusted. They're silly. They make me laugh every day. They love people. They love other dogs. Very well adjusted dogs. Why is what I was able to do with my knowledge and learning that I've learned from others? I didn't invent it. I've learned from other experts. Why is that not on the same value? I created a safe environment for them and a pleasant life for them. Why is that not valued in our industry as much as a Schutzen trainer or Mondia ring? Mm. You know, I can do shuts and I can do Mondia. In fact, my healer would be excellent at it. I don't care. I'm not interested. I want my dogs. I don't need the, the awards, you know? And again, why? Why do people go into these sports? Some of them really love it. Like I love, and don't get me wrong. I love seeing a Malinois go across the field and take the bad guy down. I love it as much as I love seeing a sheep dog move sheep or a cattle dog move cattle. Like that's what they were bred for. It's the other things that I don't like that go along with those particular sports that are unnecessary. It's just get you there faster and so that you can win more trophies and breed the dogs. And I think that's um, that's a similar, oh. phenom similar phenomenon <clears throat> when we think about some of the things that children are kind of, um, you know, when you think about the pageant stuff, when you think about gymnastics, when you think about whatever it is, and the majority are doing it in a very collaborative, cooperative way with the child because they enjoy it and it's a bit of fun. But some of these kids are being made to do it at all cost because they have to win and they have to get the trophy. And I think uh, we see those kind of similar things. And going back to the red zone uh, style dog thing, you know, these dogs who are the most challenging um, cases, and I, and I work with them myself um, quite often on the back of them having had a lot of suppression training um they're screaming need they need the need for relief or the need for safety and and uh, actually i can i can only talk anecdotally but having working with some of the more complex cases there isn't one that hasn't had a physiological or a emotional crisis element to it um especially on the physiological side of it and i think this is what's missing when some of these uh, trainers say but yeah as a last resort as a last resort what to make that dog shut up so it's, it's, just, it's just really, really sad, I think, the, the lack of understanding of what creates that dog. You know? Bring me the science that that works. Somebody said it on TV, so that's fact. They're all about science and really old science and really painful science. So show me the science, please, where it says that, um, because my experience of working with red zone cases uh, all day, every day, never been bitten. Um, and yes, bites can happen to the best trainer. I've certainly been warned. Um, but I haven't been bitten because I don't push the dog to the need to bite me. Um, so I don't value trainers who proudly show their are and the Schutzen school trainers all had that. Look at all, you know, look at this scar, look at this scar. Like same thing with a bucking horse. You know, you didn't train the horse well enough to accept the saddle on the ground and you get on and you, you can ride a buck. So does that make you a good cowboy? I disagree on that too. Um, so the red zone cases is one of those red herrings that they have been, the aversive trainers have been allowed to scream about. If you're going to say something, show me the science. I can show you reams of science that says positive reinforcement trainer is more effective. 
and um, creates a better bond. I can show you the science that says there is a, in fact, a human canine bond. Um, they love the science. So we, I think we have an obligation to hold their feet to the fire when they're saying very old things like dominance theory is their God, one of their gods. Hey, buddy, you might want to read the literature the last 20, 30 years. It's out of date. It's been debunked. Yeah. You really look unprofessional and behind the times. And you got one, one title and that's it. One master trainer, whatever it is. 20 years ago and you don't keep learning. I mean, that's one thing that I love about the people that I interviewed for my second book. Some of their credentials, if you will, were longer than the Q&A that I had with them. Some of them even said, cut that in half, that's embarrassing. It's not because these people are trying to say, look at me, I have 40 credentials, credentials and mine are better than yours. It's because we're students of the dog and there's always more to learn. In fact, that's the best part of the dog training industry right now is scientists are factually studying dogs, hopefully in kinder ways. And there's just like an explosion of information that is provable that has not happened before in our lifetimes. That is a, the good part. It's just, you can pick and choose your science. You can even you can. buy the science. <laughs> and you can, and you choose, and you get to choose the lens, of course, and which, through which you look. And I think this is, again, where we, we might see some of these differences because, um, if you're looking through a lens of wanting to advocate and support the dog and to help them feel safe and to help them find relief and to find out what their story is, it's very different from looking for a lens of, I can get the dog to stop doing this if I do this. Um, I worked with a, with a Rottweiler across uh, last year um, who used to, who was growling and lunging at children. They, they worked with a, an aversive trainer and it was only two sessions, Annie. The dog stopped doing the lunging and growling. And, and they were actually happy because they thought, well, that's the problem. It's all great. They even went as far as leaving a good review. Um, but then six months later, and this is the thing, in the moment, you might think, right, look, I've, I've saved this dog from being euthanized because the dog stopped it. Great. But where's the looking at what that future brings? Because in this particular case, six months later, the dog bit a child. And it was kind of an inevitability because... From the dog's point of view, that the problem for them hadn't been addressed, which is helping them to feel safe around kids. Uh, they just feared the consequence of acting the way they were before more than they struggled to feel socially safe around kids. So I, I think um, it is really problematic, and uh, uh, you know, um, you know, this term extremist has come up a little bit recently, and and I do think if we look at the extremes of both sides because there's always that bit in the middle where actually there's probably some trainers where there is only a little bit of difference you know because it's always on a bit of a spectrum but the extremes on using the reinforcement side of things what is that what is the potential fallout for that at the end of the day the extremes on the other side is animal abuse exactly. it's quite it's quite a difference when you think about it and i think um we have to think about the i saw again a, a comment made by somebody where they were like you know a lot of the balance trainers I know, they use a lot of reinforcement, but they might, but they might fall into some aversive sometimes, and they're not those abusive people. They wouldn't use chocolates. But the point is, you're you're share, you are sharing a camp there, um, uh, which becomes problematic again, I think. And let's just say that um, two things. One, if we were all plumbers, you know, we might just get on our high horse and say, "You're using the wrong pipe, you stupid idiot," or "You didn't go to the." number one plumbing school in the United States, and I did. Fine, argue over it. That happens in lots of professions, but it's a sink, it's a toilet, it's a pipe. It's not a living, breathing thing at the other end of your expertise or lack thereof. Um, and if I think about this sometimes, if I heard, this is a real story. If I heard my neighbor, this part isn't real, line up his ranch dogs, tie them by the leash and a collar to a long line and systematically cut off their tails, as puppies because they're Australian tail uh, shepherds and they can't have tails in the field blood is going everywhere there were nine puppies that really happened to a client of mine what if you're the ninth puppy mm. or the first I don't know what the hell is happening people cut off their ears at home they cut off their tail they're butchering animals so if I'm looking out my window and I see neighbor Bob cutting off the tails of their dog and I call the police I'm a good citizen I see, uh, if I'm looking out the window, and that really happened. I had to um, work with two of the a kind person rescued two of them. We don't know what happened to the rest. Terrified of leashes. Can you blame them? 
It took six months to even get near a leash with them. How do you walk a dog if they're terrified of leeches? We got them there. Thank God they had very patient people. So imagine your shot, your your tail is cut off by your caring owner. You go to a house and they leave, they come at you at the leash and you snap. Well, let's strap a shot collar on it. I mean, those kinds of things, situations break my heart. Mm. We, did, we did not in any way harm those dogs. We built them up and built up their confidence and reframed what a leash meant to them. Yes, it took six months. Guess what? The rest 10, 10 12 years of their lives, they could be walked. And I didn't hurt, harm them any further. So if I'm looking out my window and I see neighbor Bob strapping the collar on the dog and, the, and he says, lay down, and the dog doesn't lay down and I see him turn the dial up and I see the dog wince, and they do. They would, you know, they say use it on the lowest thing. It's just a tickle. They will say this on their and marketing drives me crazy because I have a marketing background. It, it, they will say on their web pages, those who love electric collars, shock collars, it's electric. It's an e stem. It doesn't hurt. It's it's bullshit. It's meant to hurt. It's meant to get the dog's attention attention and stop a behavior through pain. Period. End of story. So if I'm watching neighbor Bob do this and the dog's shrieking. And I call animal control and say, he's put something on the dog. I'm not sure what it is, but he's shrieking in his backyard. And in, a, in countries where it's illegal, he might go to jail. In the United States, it's like, it's fine. He's not really doing it. What's the difference between putting that on and the dog, if you're, even if you're doing it correctly? Again, I know how to use it correctly. So don't come at me with that one. Find new ways, please. And I look forward to your angry emails. Um, what's, what is the difference? of somebody taking a bat and hitting them because the dog's jumping on the kid and using something that is causing pain, a sharp jerk. They did helicoptering at the Schutzen School. That was as appalling as um, the shock collar. And I saw with my own eyes dogs run through it weekly. So don't tell me that it's the last resort and it saves dogs' lives. When if it, many dogs are willing to run through it while you're harming them, and then what have you done? <laughs> Um, yeah, and we know that the, the likelihood is those dogs who are at that point where they are potentially dangerous now, it's because they haven't been listened to in the past and they haven't had the relief and they haven't had the safety. And, and I agree with you. I always think we've got the Animal Welfare Act over here, which is pretty clear, actually, about unnecessary pain and discomfort. But um, there does seem to be a bit of a get out. And like, you, you're right. If I, if I went round to um, somebody's house and kicked their dog, I could get reported, but if I went around there and in the name of training, uh, you know, put some of these tools on or, or yanked the dog's neck with a lead, it's it's okay, you know. Um, uh, and also when we think about it, you know, again, there's a lot of similarities here when we think about the role and the and the approval of, in some, for some people, corporal punishment for children. And um, I remember at school, you know, I, I was, I, I, I had a, very traumatic event that happened to me when I was younger. I didn't share it with my parents at the time. It came out later when I had a breakdown. Um, but it meant that I was I was in a traumatized state, which meant that I wasn't functioning properly at school. But back then, because I'm an old git, so it's a long time ago, uh, we still had the slipper and cane. And I went through probably eight or 10 months after the traumatic event of getting the slipper and cane because I was not behaving. And, I, and that, that's, you shared earlier at the, at the top of the hour about your own kind of experiences of, of knowing what it's like to have others want to have to control you and, uh, you know, not give you a voice. And, and I think many of us who've experienced these things, we can't really detach ourselves from what we see happening with dogs around us. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, 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 the, it's the exertion of control over the vulnerable. Exactly that. And no one will ever do that to me in my life again. And I'll be damned if I see it happening in front of me to a dog. You know, it's just what keeps me up at night and fills me with incredible rage. And at the same time, incredible sorrow are those dogs who are terrified, who have, are anxious, and they might be the big, strong, scary looking Rottweiler. Um, and they're expressing their discomfort and of their and frustration of their lives. And the only thing they have to defend themselves with are their sharp teeth. And so then you put something around their neck that just shuts them down completely. You have not solved the problem for the dog. You've solved the problem for the human who's tired of the dog barking, lunging, jumping on people, trying to kill other dogs. Um, but you have not solved the problem for the dog. In fact, you've created a volcano that is likely to erupt. And the, the second the dog, some dogs, some dogs just get depressed and just are robots. What kind of life is that? It's equally as bad. 
but every now and then a dog, a big dog will defend itself and big enough to do it comes at the trainer. Um, you know, Dr. Karen Overall, who's been a very strong um, speak, has, she is one of the first that spoke up veterinary behaviorists about how evil and wrong shock collars are. She's taken a lot of grief for it. She, I wrote about her dog Flash, which many people have heard of, which was her favorite breed, Australian Shepherd. Put three people in the emergency room, including the first one was the trainer that the unsuspecting owners took the dog to, the young male Australian Shepherd, and um, the dog growled at the trainer. The trainer said, no dog growls at me. This is a true story. It's in my book. You can talk to Dr. Overall about it. The trainer strung the dog up until it passed out. The dog mm -hmm. laid on the ground. I showed him, didn't I? And the owners are horrified, but didn't know because owners don't know what you're going to get. The dog woke up and attacked the trainer. <laughs> mm. And also, I think it's also interesting as in this kind of this uh, attachment to that, which what we were talking about earlier, when we do see maulings, when we do see the kind of um, people getting very badly attacked or sadly dying, it is often children, is often the, um, the more vulnerable in the home because the dog isn't going to necessarily, in these cases, attack that trainer who's going to give the biggest punishment back. You know, those, those needs are not being met. Uh, but there is a fear of the consequence if you dare to try and communicate to one. So at some point, that brain's just going to snap. And we see that with kind of humans, let alone, let alone dogs as well, I think. And, and um, uh, I, I, this is another thing I get I hear is this notion that, yeah, but the people uh, are, they, we, you know, they need that dog to stop doing things. It's really affecting them. Uh, this is a way to kind of give them what it is they need. But the point is they haven't been told a, the story of their dog to even compare that against. And I find the majority of people I work with, when they hear it and they get it, that care side of them really takes on a big thing for them. But that hasn't been allowed because they've been told your dog's been dominant, your dog's been willful, your dog's been stubborn. All these labels are there to kind of justify a, an absolute task approach. Your dog knows better, but he's defying you. Really? <laughs> Um, you know, I have hundreds and hundreds of examples of dogs that are mistreated because of my work in rescue and training. And it's the good people that bring me in and people like me for the red zone case or whatever you would like to make up and call it, call them the very troubled dogs with very big teeth. Um, I'm the fifth or sixth or seventh trainer that happened so many times. So it didn't work. The five times they, they ab abused the dog in name of training coached by a trainer it didn't solve the problem, made it worse, or the dog is completely shut down and unhappy and depressed. Um, and one Rottweiler, you mentioned a Rottweiler you worked with. I, one, I love Rottweilers. And one of my um, favorite dogs, I can't remember her name, I worked with so many, and it was in Colorado. There's a lot of res dogs that are not treated as valued pets, I would say, in certain communities. And the Four Corners in Durango is near several reservations. People are always trying to rescue them, spay and neuter them, get them into homes. Um, this lovely couple, I'll just tell this really quickly, picked up a, um, they saw a, on a ridge, a Rottweiler running with a coyote chasing it. They pull over, they whistle, they, it's a Rottweiler. Right? They call the dog, the dog jumps in the back of the car, off they go. They had another trip, month long trip planned. I was working out of a kennel at the time. They, they knew the kennel owner, they dropped the dog off and they said, oh, you have a trainer, could you train the dog? I'm like, yes, thank you for rescuing this dog. You're good citizens. And they were going to keep the dog. And they did keep the dog. So I get the Rottweiler out. And I notice right away that it sits funny, like those dogs with painful hips. Okay, um, And it's depressed, like just that deep, dark hole of depression that we know that people can get into, like just lethargic. And so I tried for a few days to help this dog. The only thing that got the dog at all acting like a dog, like alert and not that deadness behind its eyes, was there was a Navajo kennel tech and he came from Navajo country and he loved her. I used her to teach a recall because he bounded to her. So he had some good positive experiences, right? With um, the Navajo people, but he also had horrific experiences. Maybe not some, maybe they didn't do it on purpose because he was running loose. Who knows? Dumped. I don't know. They, this couple picked him up and I said, your dog is, is in pain. This was 15 years ago and it's a Rottweiler and they can have Addison's disease. Something is amiss, maybe thyroid, I don't know, autoimmune, but he, your dog seems in pain to me and listless and depressed. Take it to the vet. It's not fair for me to continue to ask this dog, sit down, stay, especially I'm worried about the hips. Excellent owners, they picked it up that day, took it to the vet, broken pelvis from being hit by a car or God knows what that had, see, that had healed, 
on its own. Imagine the pain of that. And it had Addison's. Mm -hmm. So they took the dog home for a month, gave it all the vet recommended medication, brought it back, a completely different dog. It went on to be a therapy dog. So what if that dog came to me and I said, you're being disobedient. You're a big stubborn red zone case with big shiny teeth and I'm gonna strap a shock collar on you. I mean, pain after pain after pain after distrust after mistrust after mistrust. I would have done a huge disservice to that dog. And that's the trauma that you and I and others are talking about. You know, yeah. how do you do that to a dog? You don't have the right. And in many places, you don't have the legal right to do that. And I think if you understand these things, if you understand the importance of doing the right checks regarding the, the physiological, the, you know, the um, uh, potential pain, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain, uh, then um, you wouldn't be working in that other way. You just wouldn't. And these things aren't being done. We have got a TV show over here where one of the episodes had to be taken down because the guy had done his usual kind of, uh, you know, correction stuff. And then if they found out that the dog had really bad arthritis and uh, because but guess what a lot of the time with these tv shows again people end up having to get other help down the line because it doesn't it doesn't stick you know and i think it's important to say you know with, with rottweilers especially because uh, our next chat actually uh, coming up next week with with angela curtis from the rossi rescue here and angela's amazing advocate for rottweilers is they're just such an amazing dog to have and to and to um and to and to spend time with i think uh, you know, when we see these cases, something's gone very wrong because they're, they're, they're too easily demonized, I think, as a, as a breed. And, uh, and I think um, and this is what happened again, because what I love about Angela and the work that she does is uh, there are certain breeds that attract a certain mentality, often from, from the, the male side of things, I think. But uh, that somehow, you know, you, and this is what was told to this, this, this family when I went to see them with this dog previously was that if you don't get firm with this dog he's going to end up uh, you know being a potential risk to everybody and, and all this kind of crap that comes out as a as a kind of a dialogue a narrative to excuse the, that type of thing and uh, and it's potentially really dangerous uh, because talk about saving dogs life this dog could easily have lost its life because of that now you know luckily in that particular case it didn't do harm as such. Well, I'm, I'm sure the child wasn't very keen on what happened, but but uh, even with all this stuff, this poor dog had just been some completely, completely suppressed down. Uh, let's finish off uh, on a positive, Annie. I think that's cool. I'm gonna see if I can get my camera back onto that. But why not? Yeah, so you're just um, funny. Andrew's camera wasn't working, and that's why it's just me. Yeah, it's been a bit of a nightmare. I, I need to I need to get a new uh, this camera or at least maybe a new computer. I don't know. It's, it's, it's doing it again. I gotta stop it. So sorry about that. Um, uh, you say about your new book coming out. I think it's a really important thing actually uh, that you've done uh, because I know the book started off as one thing and then ended up with something very very different actually um, uh, and unusually for some of these uh, for, for a book of this nature you you reached out to the professionals to say I, I, you very kindly asked me to contribute as well uh, one of the things that came up when you were asking all the contributors was that everybody seemed or well, felt quite optimistic and positive actually about about things um, uh, and that's interesting isn't it and it's good I think well, I'm laughing because Shay Kelly and Denise Moore, who are also in the book, tell me I didn't ask them. I'm like, okay, but I have proof in writing that I asked everyone else. Um, but even they, he says he's half optimistic, half not. Um, but my own book had a profound uh, change in me, which I did not expect. I'm a reporter, and reporters are taught to distance yourself and be a, you know, we're just we're observing and we're reporting on what happened. Like reporters. You know, I've covered car wrecks where horrible things have happened as a junior reporter, um, but we're just trained to not be emotional about it. So I was not expecting my own book, a nonfiction um, written for owners, to have a profound effect on me. And what did it was talking to the co my colleagues and you and Denise, Denise Amores and the Shea Kellys and so on and so forth, American, Canadian. Um, they may had a profound effect on me because of their optimism. And because of the things that they were doing, like my favorite thing in the world is to interview interesting people who are helping animals. I mean, that's, that's how my books appeared. That's why I wrote for Dogster. Um, I absolutely love it. And that's really what I should be doing the great majority of my life. I also like helping individual dogs. 
Um, so they're doing fascinating things. And as Denise Amore says, choose your battles and their head is down and they're working hard for, um, for dogs every single day. They're not out there keyboard worrying, saying you're using the wrong quadrant, you stupid idiot, or my, my certification means more than yours because I decided that it did, or red zone case or any of this crap that's flying every day out there in dog land. Um, it's real world stuff to me. That's why I think their contributions were so value and the interviews kind of build on each other. And um, there are lots of experts in the world and force-free experts. I'm only going to interview force-free people because that's my prerogative. Um, I'm not interested in giving a platform to the other kind of trainer ever. So they, I did ask them, are you positive? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Because I kind of took myself out of the industry for a variety of reasons and I had a great time for five years. <laughs> Um, and I'm, and in fact, I told you at the beginning, I said, I'm going to be so mad at you, you and And Andrew, you and Kim Brophy and Laura Donaldson, if I go back to consulting, because I have not, I sort of dabbled in it, but it was not my main thing, because it's exhausting, <laughs> and I don't want to do it, and I'll just write this book and move on, and there we're done. But the things that I learned in writing the book put a little fire under me, and it started with Beyond the Operant, uh, which is Andrew's chats with um, various professionals, and it's on YouTube, because I started writing in August, and I had six months, which is ridiculous, deadline. I just happen to be a person who loves deadlines. I stopped writing and said, Beyond the what? Beyond the, I mean, I know what opera means. Um, and I watched every single one of those. And I'm like, meanwhile, the clock is ticking. You have to write a 300 page book, Annie. You don't have time to be watching YouTube videos. But what you, the people that you were interviewing, then I'd go watch their videos. I'm like, what are they doing? What is Sarah Fisher doing? What is, Sarah Fisher Ask why all the time. That's her favorite question as well. What is she talking about free work? What is Laura Don Donaldson talking about slowing down and cognitive reappraisal? I had not heard that term as it relates to dogs. What is Kim Brophy and legs? What is that? And now I'm a family dog mediator because her course was so fantastic to me um, and so badly needed, I will say. Um, so all of these people had a huge impact on me because I also began myself asking about reactivity and aggression since that's still the number one concern with owners. What's new since I wrote the Midnight Dog Walkers? And I wasn't very, I was very pessimistic. I'm like, I'm right. I didn't want to write the book and I very nearly didn't and thank God I did. Um, for my own sake, because I learned so much from these other professionals. Um, I didn't want to do it because it's a lot of work, but I did do it and it did have a profound effect on me. And I hope that it does for owners as well. I wanted something, a kind of a how-to, if you will, of the basics of just stick your toe in there. Like Kim Brophy says, there weren't dog trainers, official dog trainers until 50 or 100 years ago, maybe military trainers. So we live side by side with these amazing creatures. So Try some stuff. Yes, get educated, but be aware of who is educating you and what their motivations may be. Um, and if it doesn't sit well with you, um, it, you, you, that hair goes up on the back of your neck when the owner, when the trainer does something that you find distasteful or harmful to your dog, pull your dog and leave, walk out. You have yeah. every right to do that. Like listen to that intuition. This makes me feel uncomfortable. This is my best friend and it's crouching on the floor or it's urinating on the floor because it's terrifying. And so that's why I wrote it. Um, it did have a big effect on me personally. I am consulting with people again. I'm sort of still mad at you and Kim and the rest. <laughs> but I, I'm doing it with a nude, renewed passion because of what these other experts are doing. You know, like I'm not the ones that, I'm not the trainer that invents the Phoenix, Annie Phoenix protocol and I never will. That's not my role. And you've said that to me several times. We each have our role. We each have a part of mm -hmm. the thing. My role is to shine a light, I feel like on people who are doing wonderful things. Um, so and of course, you and uh, the amazing Denise, uh, a good friend to both of us, and who's been our wing woman uh, when we've needed that extra support. Um, you have your own chats, of course, which uh, which are really important, and you've had some great guests on, and uh, so people can look out for that. Where else can they find more Annie? Um, Midnight Dog Walkers group. It is a private Facebook group. I do look at everyone who wants to join. I like I look at their profiles. Um, if we're in the same groups. Um, because there's like five groups. Yours is one. Dog Center Care is one that we recommend highly. Safe zones, safe areas where we're not arguing over if you just do it right for the 10,000th time, then the shot collar doesn't hurt, that sort of thing. Old, 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 very tired, very inaccurate arguments. Um, <clears throat> because that really is gaslighting and uh, potentially traumatic to see that argument again and to see two trainers go at each other. We didn't really discuss that very much. Uh, but that two positive reinforcement trainers going at it and then you get tribalism well I like this one and you're stupid and she's awful and she didn't this 20 years ago well we all did something else 20 years ago most likely um, that to me is reigniting trauma because mm. 
being two professionals, you like both, or maybe you like one better than the other. And, and none of us are gods, by the way. <laughs> Please don't give individuals that much uh, priority over your life. It's distressing, di disturbing. And so I love these safe zones. Um, Midnight Dog Walkers is one. You know, I just, I, I, you, you have to sign the rules that you agree to. I'm not, I'm not, this is not a platform to discuss painful tools or methods, period. If you try your little sneaky stuff, I'll boot you. Don't even try it. And so they don't. Like it, we don't moderate very much. We don't have to. Um, dog centered care, which a years group is much bigger. Um, same thing. It's a positive environment that feels safe as much as it's ever going to be safe online. And I think it's more important to seek those safe places out and those safe people. When I sat back and looked at the people I interviewed, I felt safe with them just knowing them online. Some I knew, some I didn't. Many, most I didn't know personally. And I do now and count them as friends, which is amazing to me. Um, but, but they were safe people and compassionate people. And um, they all are, every single one of them is. They're not mean people fighting and saying, I'm right, you're wrong. I'm so tired of that. We're all tired of that. And I also think uh, dog trainers need to say, I am representing the profession as piss poor as we are as professionals. And there are going to organizations attempting to drag us through the mud and try to make us behave as more professionals. Um, you are representing dog trainers everywhere when you go on a platform. You and I having this talk, we are representing dog trainers. Happens to be the ones that are using force, um, but we are representing the profession. And I think people need to take note of that. Anything you do online, like I was taught as a journalist and PR person, I know I'm going on a tangent and I'll shut up in a second, but um, don't put anything in writing that you don't expect to see in the New York Times ever. This is way before social media. That's how I was brought up as a journalist, especially working in politics. You know, there are no secrets, there are no, what you're saying on your private page, just because you're a trainer and you think it's private that could be screenshotted tomorrow and shared with your clients, shared with your boss, shared with your professional organizations. So be more aware of that and be more aware that our fighting amongst each other, although I will always fight and defend dogs, I will do that. Um, that's, that's important, that's different to me. I will defend dogs who are being abused by trainers. That's different than saying you're wrong and you're stupid because you don't have the same credentials, you know what I mean? I will speak out against abuse. Um, but when you go at each other online or you're snarky, you're representing all of us and you're either shutting, potentially shutting down a young trainer who's like, this is, so many trainers come to me and I'm sure you too. I'm not sticking my head out. Y'all are vicious. Y'all are a mean group, especially women being mean to women. Just absolutely stop it. Like all of you need to grow up. And, and I'm not going to mince my words about that. It's, it's depressing to see it. It's trauma inducing for many of us. You're shutting down discourse. Um, and again, you could say, well, you're shutting down discourse talking about horse trainers. I, I see that as abuse and I will speak up against abuse, um, period. Um, so those of us who are not abusing animals and calling it trainer, calling it training, please be kind to one another and, and take a minute, do the cognitive reappraisal that Laura thinks about. I have to do it sometimes, things get so heated because uh, I'm the queen of block. <laughs> I will block you fairly easily. And sometimes I'm like, I don't really wanna block this person. I've known him for 20 years. Maybe they're having a bad day. Um, you know, take a breath before you respond. You don't have to come to every argument. So, no, and I think those filters that we most, you know, most of us have in real life, you know, if we're in a room where we're thinking, where we read the room and think, well, would this be appropriate? Should I say that? Should I let it go? It, it's easy to lose those filters when you're behind a keyboard, I think, and just kind of whacking away. But uh, I think taking a breath is always a good idea. <clears throat> we don't always have to dive in and, um, uh, and it's okay to disagree on stuff. You know, I get people send me things when they see my name brought up in a negative way somewhere because of various things. And um, and I'm not precious about stuff. I can only share what I share. And I, and I already understand that there's going to be many people who don't take, share that point of view. Um, and, and I think we've got to pick our battles, really. I, I don't see the point in just arguing a point. And I, and I like to think that this is my own personal thing, but the same with you as well, though, Annie, with your books and, and things as well that my kind of, my thoughts are out there. I don't have to keep saying them. I don't have to keep fighting for them. You either get it or you don't. I'm always, I always love constructive uh, kind of debate and conversation. And uh, we have some great ones in Dog Center Care sometimes. I, I keep a little eye on things. You know, I don't like to jump in heavily moderate, but it's amazing how people just kind of sort it out in a nice way, which is, that can be done. <laughs> That's a great place to finish, I think. Um, uh, so thank you so much, Annie. We've covered, covered a lot tonight. Just to let everybody know, um, the uh, what I've been doing now, I'm going to be picking a rescue each month. Uh, so anybody who really loves the chats and they want to 
just kind of um, appreciate that if, if you're able to, then uh, I'm just going to put the address in the chat here for Rothy Friend, because that's the, the charity, the rescue of the month, if you like. And the wonderful Angela Curtis is our next guest. Uh, I can't wait for you to uh, hear Angela uh, talk about what she does at the rescue, talk about the breed. I think it's going to be a really wonderful chat. So let's see if we can raise a few pennies for them. Um, but uh, only if you can, of course, there's no expectation to do that. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Annie. Thank you so much for tonight. Yes, and thank you as always. I love these discussions and I love what you're doing in the world. And I know that I call you and uh, the Kim Brophys of the world, Laura Donaldson, Sarah Fishers, the tip of the spear, and you are paradigm shifting the industry, whether the industry wants to be changed or not. And I think in a very good way, but whenever you're um, the paradigm shifter, you face the wrath. And I know you guys have faced the wrath weekly, daily, and um, I, I might, I just have them all blocked. <laughs> I don't know if they're coming for me or not. Um, yeah. So I really appreciate it. It takes courage to have conversation. This conversation takes courage. And I do not lack courage when it comes to defending dogs. If someone else doesn't want to defend dogs and they don't feel that they have the courage to do it, I'll do it. You'll do it. Yeah. For those of us who will do it. You don't have to choose our path and the way we're doing it. But also I wanted to say that Denise and I, Omar, would love to have you come in um, May to celebrate the so-called promotion uh, publication of the new book because you are an integral part of the book and had a huge impact on me when I was writing it so I would love nothing more to that month have you be our first guest and talk about what all has happened in the two years since I've been working on this project well that's a real uh that'd be a real privilege and an honor so yeah 100 percent. So, so are you flying me over is that how yes. it works yeah, oh, cool. Yeah, uh, no, that'll be great. No, I look forward to that for sure. And uh, uh, great. Well, thank you, Annie, and um, thanks for all the stuff you do. And uh, I think it's been great to have you in the spotlight a little bit tonight, literally, because my camera's not working. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's been great, and I think uh, anybody who doubts your your fire <laughs> when it comes to advocating for the vulnerable, like you say, it's not just recognizing giving the dog's voice it's looking at any like say marginalized or disenfranchised part of society really we, we have to start thinking about that more widely actually about our approaches so so thank you so much for tonight thank you everybody uh, next thursday 19th angela curtis in the group um and uh yeah thank you everybody have a good evening afternoon morning wherever you are and uh, and great thanks annie thank you appreciate it